it's seven o'clock. Actually, it's seven o one. Um, we need to co uh, convene the meeting of the Waterbury Select Board for Monday, November the twenty first, two thousand twenty two, in the Steel Room because of technology. It will be solely an in person meeting, as it will be. The, uh, we do not have a Zoom capability tonight. Alyssa, you're taking minutes? Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, the first item on the agenda is to approve the, uh, tonight's agenda. Are there any... Uh, I'll move to approve. Okay. Do we have a second to approve? Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion on the agenda? There being none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, any abstentions? Motion passes. Next item on the agenda is the consent agenda items for the minutes of November 7th, 2022 to approve the first and, first and third class liquor license for Pine Martin LLC, uh, Stone Straw Waterbury, and the LMP adoption page completed and signed for submission to uh, Vermont Emergency Management. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on the consent agenda items? There being none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Now is the time in the agenda is for anyone in the public to speak on any issues that are not covered under the formal agenda. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak? Skip. Got a couple of things under public that, uh, first I'd just like to thank the select board for the uh, support on the 51 South Main Street project there. It was uh, your most welcome. Big turnout and we appreciate your support. It's what, three more days to go? Um, <laughs> Close, yeah, 24th, so yeah. No, Friday, maybe. We haven't heard anything about a petition, but no. we're hopeful on things. Eh? We've already started the ball rolling with Downstreet, kind of a pre option agreement that we've signed. and things. So thank you for that. And then uh, I have a met with you folks since Bill's big parties and uh, open house here and things and all the work that Ingrid did, sort of the open house um, was kind of from the, you know, the uh, two boards and things that give the public an opportunity to thank Bill and uh, extend their wishes to him. So the uh, commissioners had started a card thanking Ingrid um, for all our work on this behalf, and I didn't know a few folks would like to sign, and we would send it. If so, I'll pass it around. And um, lastly, um, this is the uh, gift we gave Bill on behalf of the select board, EFUD, and the Waterbury citizens, thanking him for his 34 years. I barely got it done before the. Uh, <laughs> dinner on Saturday night, so I know none of you have seen it. You've only heard about it from the dinner. Um, but I put it together. Uh, this is a part of a beam from 51 South Main Street that was built in around 1820. So it's a little over 200 years old. Um, and things that I, uh, I'll read what I wrote on it here. Presented on behalf of the citizens of Waterbury in gracious appreciation to William Bill Sheplet for his 34 years of dedicated service as manager in protecting and promoting the health, safety, and welfare of the residents of Waterbury. Well done, good and faithful servant to Bill. And uh, this plaque is a piece of a hand-hewn timber from the Wells Crossett House located at 51 South Main Street. Bill, as the manager, was the last person uh, in that municipal office when he left work on August 26th before it got flooded on the uh, 28th. So um, 
when he left his office that day, it never looked the same after that. And uh, I don't know if you've noticed on Bill's office, he has one of these uh, kind of a metal sculpture of a fly fisherman standing up. But I thought in his retirement, he might go fishing, setting down. So I got one setting down. And also, this is a uh, pen from Orvis made out of maple wood with a brook trout on it. And we gave him a Orvis hat with a brown trout taking a fly on it. So he would have a proper hat when he goes out fishing. So. Um, the hats at home. I, that's, that's been on my desk, so that was easy to get here, but the hats at home. <laughs> um, so I'll just pass around. You folks can see what your name is on. And, uh, and you, you, you know, said really, you were getting some kind of plate for that oh, yes. inscription? Uh, what I printed up on photographic paper, I'm going to get engraved so it'll have a. Uh, I don't know, they're brass plates or whatever it is with screws on it there. And the oldest picture I have of, uh, you know, 51 South Main Street, and also a picture of Bill and, uh, well, Bill's out there planting flowers. Ingrid probably took that picture of you planting flowers. I used to see him out there every a day or so in May, spending all day Sunday or Saturday planting the flowers on both sides of the walk that they used to do pretty faithfully. So, so anyway, there's uh, the rest of the story. Thank you, Skip, and thank you for all your part on helping that, along with Ingrid, helping that event go on. It was uh, very enjoyable. I think everybody had a the time, I don't know if we had any count of how many came on Saturday or not, but it seemed pretty steady full. there. You hear know what I mean? Pardon? At the, At the open house? Yeah. Oh, here? Yeah. Um, well, we had a guest. I, I don't have it, that, but there's a guest book that's been signed, but there was a good number that came. I would say a couple hundred or more? Good. To, yeah. Probably by the end there was hundred and, yeah, something. I, I don't know for certain, but. It took a little while when uh, Tom came in with his family. There was almost nobody here, so <laughs> they probably went home saying, well, that was a pretty <laughs> interesting send-off. Ingrid was probably pretty nervous that nobody was coming. No, Bill was nervous. <laughs> Ingrid was fine. They'll come, they'll come. And then somebody said, well, it says remarks at 2.30, so they'll all be here to hear Skip make his remarks. <laughs> Um, well, it was good to see everybody. I enjoyed it was, seeing the folks. It was great. Thank you all for your, all the time with for your part in it. Uh, Skip, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but I believe that that's Lefty's barn still standing <laughs> in the background. <laughs> <laughs> there have been offers to burn it down or tow it, you know. <laughs> I think maybe. Okay. Hey, is there any other members of the public who wish to say something? There being none, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, select board items. First, an update on the ARPA funding survey and preparation for the December uh, 5th forum. Uh, yeah, I put that on the uh, agenda. Um, the uh, mailing went out uh, with a lot of help from Alyssa and Danny uh, in the composing of it and I helped arrange the, the mailing uh, through the mail house uh, in Barrie. Uh, I got mine on Saturday. I don't know if others have received theirs yet, but uh, okay. So it is out there in the mail uh, and uh, Tom, I believe you've already received a, a couple? About 30. About 30, great. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to uh, see what ideas we had about conducting the forum. Um, and I don't, unfortunately, don't really have a, a strict plan in mind, but I do think that it's worth uh, taking a bit of time to uh, discuss how we want to conduct that because we have invited the public to uh, weigh in on these, uh, on these items. So, any ideas? 
think well, it was a no, I was going to say kudos to Roger. Sometimes yeah. I like to edit things for too long, and at a certain point I saw it had been sent, so thank you for getting it done. Yeah. Um, I was also line. just going to note that there is an online component, and that that information is posted on the homepage of the municipal website with the link to the online Google form. Um, mm -hmm. I don't even know if I or Dan will have back-end access, but we should look to make sure responses are going that way, so okay. folks can do the paper, folks can do the online. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of the question for December 5th, I think probably there should be some modicum of introductory presentations um, yeah. by us, uh, by uh, staff if they're willing, and then some structure where as folks receive a certain amount of time to speak. Um, would be two components that come to my mind, but okay. <laughs> open beyond that. No, I agree with you, Alyssa, that there should be some presentation. The question is, between now and then, with open meeting laws, can we get together to discuss? Yeah, that's why I wanted to put it on the agenda for now. How, how we would do that, and especially today, we have two two out of the five right. you know members <clears throat> absent. Well, um, I'll offer to do two things. One is uh, to compile the results, uh, unless Tom, you're interested in doing. Uh, I can do the thirty. I'm not sure how many are going to come in tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Well, this is the fifth, so we still have a week in between uh, getting back from Thanksgiving and uh, the next meeting. Um, but yeah, I appreciate your help on that, and then uh, I'll uh, I'll work with you on compiling the rest so that we can present the results that came in uh, either online uh, or uh, through the mail. Uh, and then uh, perhaps we can divide up uh, doing a short presentation on why uh, each one of those items is on the uh, was on our priority list. Does that sound reasonable? How and then best be of help? I know because with family things, I've been away and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Um, Do you want to take a look at one? I didn't bring one with me. No. Um, the one note I would have, I think, thank you, mm -hmm. um, in terms of presenting, I think we can present it, in my mind, we presented this as an equal opportunity for folks to weigh in, so right. I wouldn't want right. presenting of the survey results to come across that that was, like, that's some of the ways folks have chosen to provide input coming to this meeting is another way they can, so just in doing that, I would want to make sure that framing is uh -huh. clear. You know, like we said, yeah. use any of the following options right. doing the surveys or coming to the meeting. Um, so just would want to make sure that's clear. Um, and in terms of ideas, also just framing that as pretty preliminary. You know, I'll just say right. in terms of. Yeah, maybe we don't need to have present the results uh, right away because that could bias uh, people's input. Mm -hmm. I would think you want to be as open as possible right. That's good and then thought. compile things with the additional input that you do get at the event mm -hmm. because I'm sure okay. there's going to be input given that day. All right. And then maybe we can just uh, see what uh, people's input is and we, uh, we could run off uh, some more of those uh, surveys so that people can uh, mark their things without, if they don't feel comfortable presenting in front of the, the public, yeah. they can just fill one out and submit it right there. Right. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah. I think that sounds Okay, good. And then maybe we could do like a follow-up just at a later meeting of just compilation of results from the right, right and the meeting and yeah. that just as a... You're right, but the, the, I think we have uh, one more meeting in uh, December. Right, we have one more Okay. The, the, I think that's sufficient. Anything else anyone has to say? Just uh, on the contact for questions, I haven't received any. Okay. okay. That's because it was so clearly written. That's right. I assume it's pretty self-explanatory, and I know a lot of people do like, it's kind of like public meetings. I've seen from a lot of public meetings, people show up and make their comments that way versus write some things up, you know, it's just two different styles. So we'll see what happens. But I think, you know, we're on, we're on track to get input, which is what's important. Right. 
And again, I just think that, right, like, I just feel like this was really preliminary. This was us wanting to really solicit input exactly. and recognizing that we're going to take all the input and we'll and share it, we'll time. consider it, and we'll, well, it's done in, it's right. going to be an ongoing process. This is not anything final. This is a forum for folks to provide input. We're going to have input. We'll have further discussion. Totally agree. Anyone else? If not, we'll move on to the next item. Skip, you're up on your sewer presentation. I signed that. I guess it was supposed to be you, but it says uh, select board member, so. It's <laughs> fine. Well, thank you for uh, having me. I. Uh, I don't know who chose the title, but I would have chose a different title. I saw Alex in the store the other day, and he said, oh, you're coming to the select board to talk about the sewer presentation, he said. I said, are you coming? He said, no. I think a better title would have uh, helped, you know, just the sewer. Do you want to offer one? Yeah, can you start? Waste water? Or oh, water? what are you talking about? about? The magnificence of infrastructure in downtown. Maybe I'll come to us during the presentation. All right. From outhouse to toilet. What is the P stand for? I look. <laughs> 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 Let wow. Let me show that wasn't up when you said that. One. There we go. Now we're no, now it's more in focus. So uh, I don't know how many of you know my background as civil engineer with my master's degree in sanitary engineering. So this may be too detailed for some of you. <laughs> anyway, um, this is the uh, village sewer system from uh, 1899 when they started talking or thinking about it to the current day. Um, you know, in Waterbury back before 1899, they depended on outhouses and you were really uh, at a luxury if you had an indoor outhouse, and there are many houses in Waterbury today, you can see where the indoor outhouse was, yeah. that you didn't have to go outdoors. And upstairs in, in hmm. Jamesville. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, that picture is one of my favorite postcards. It was an advertisement for Lifesaver. If it doesn't have a hole in it, it isn't a Lifesaver. I wanted to put it on a Duxbury, uh, Waterbury historic calendar, and the ladies would let me do it. So I got to use it anyway. That's fine. Um, just kind of a quick time frame the village chartered in 1882. They built the water system in 1895. They voted to design a sewer collection system in 1899. They actually built it in 1907, so good to show you the good things take a little longer. But it did last until uh, the recent Main Street construction. It was in use. We built a primary treatment state, uh, system, which is down by where the pump station is by the underpass now in 68. Then we had to build a secondary treatment system, which is the lagoon system. Uh, down by the old Henry farm, and we converted the pump station, the primary treatment system into a pump station to get it there. In 2003, we uh, changed our charter and moved the responsibility of the sewer system to the water commissioners. That prior to that, um, the trustees had the sewer and the water commissioners had the water. Um, and then in 2014, we added the tertiary comag uh, process to the treatment plan, specifically to remove phosphorus. Um, and this is a little bit of the interesting history of the early system that in uh, May of 1899, they engaged a uh, engineer, uh, V.R. Nash, from Providence, Rhode Island, to draw up the plans. Um, he was a civil engineer. Chuck Magnus recently um, gave a copy of those plans, I believe, from his grandfather that he was an uh, engineer from Norwich and uh, 
involved in government. He had them in his house and Chuck uh, donated them. Uh, Woody has them now. You'll see some prints from it. So Skip, yeah. looking back at that last thing there, he commenced work on Monday and has two weeks and one week to get the report ready. So how come it takes like 12 months to get an engineering report now? Ah, uh, that's the paperwork that... Uh, it's the Paperwork yes, I, Reduction Act. You know, uh, and you notice he's made uh, surveys for the Mount Area Electric Railroad and the sewers in Winooski and things. So, um, yeah, I read that and he, he had it done in a couple of weeks. <laughs> um, July of 1899, he had the report done in May. Um, they had already had four village meetings about it. Um, uh, they haven't voted to uh, do it. As you'll see in a little bit, the Waterbury record of all things was the community newspaper by Harry Whitehill, who started WDEB. They were against bonding for this thing, and you can huh. see that comment that the wealthy man and the man with a small tax are equally divided on both sides. The wealthy people wanted to build it and the uh, Waterbury record had convinced the others that uh, it was going to be too expensive for them to do it. So, so some things don't change in Waterbury, how they were <laughs> divided. They had four meetings. Um, this was in July of 1899. You know, Village Corporation opposed to progressive improvements. They'd already had five uh, public meetings. And uh, this was a meeting where they uh, had a warning to do it, and uh, you'll see at the bottom there, um, they voted to pass over the article from uh, 70 to 109. So, uh, see, they were divided. Um, this is a couple little articles about that controversy that was that uh, more about the sewers there on the uh, left that it wasn't uh, practical. They were thinking about uh, improvements that the village isn't is going to want other improvements over the next 20, 30 years, and uh, they're not going to be able to keep pace and. Uh, on the right there was, they were uh, critical of the uh, majority of voters that voted against putting in the sewer system and someday they'll have an epidemic of typhoid or diphtheria yeah. that's produced cesspools in Waterbury. Um, Did it say how much they, they wanted for the bond? Pardon? How much was the, the bond? 25,000. 25,000. And uh, so they didn't build it. In 1904, um, Edward Farrar, which you've heard his name as the utility district, he was the village, he was a water commissioner and he was elected village president. And because they hadn't voted to build a system, sewer system, they were installing some individual lines to uh, take the sewage from, you know, uh, sort of the foot of Bank Hill where the businesses are going down Elm Street, dumping into a uh, the reports of a small stream that comes from over Pilgrim Park, goes underneath the railroad, comes out into Main Street and goes down there. Um, they were putting in this line to carry that sewage down there and get it away from the district. Um, when he was killed in a cave-in at the head of Elm Street on uh, October 4th, 1904. It was a seven-foot deep trench, and it caved in, and he couldn't get out of it there in time. Um, so he died right, died right there. So the failure to the, install the sewers really cost uh, them their village president and water commissioner and things. I often think of that as I drive down Elm Street and Woody and uh, putting in the, uh, there's been more water leaks and other things at that spot in the system that it's 
really jinxed. It is, that's for sure. Yeah. You know. So is the, that at Pro Pig or where, where, what part of Elm Street is it? Is it down towards your house or right at uh, Pro Pig? Right, right there between the two uh, uh -huh. was uh, where the four inch line it comes down and it cut out over toward the cemetery bank there and things. Um, this is the plaque that we have had made. Um, it came here a week or two ago, but it's too cold. We're going to put it on the back of his gravestone. Um, Edward is buried out in Hope Cemetery here. Um, and they had a resolution at the next village meeting after his death that um, here it be resolved that the voters of the village of Waterbury hereby express their appreciation of Edward Farrar as a worthy citizen, faithful official, and an honest man. Geniality, integrity, and industry were striking elements of his character. Further, it be resolved that this resolution be subscribed on the village records and a copy given to the members of his family. So, um, and I found that in the village records where they said, and uh, um, we're gonna put this plaque on his gravestone. And since I've been a water commissioner and village president, I've stayed out of any trench, so. <laughs> I'm amazed they were able to elect a dead person. <laughs> I thought that stuff happened in Chicago. So they finally did in uh, February of 2000, uh, 1907, voted um, to uh, build the sewer system. It was 84 to 31, so there was only 100 and, I don't know, 14, 15 people came out where there was 180 voting against it back uh, in 1990, 1899. So, and it was uh, not the cost, to cost not more than 35,000, but they hadn't done the bid at this time. That was the, uh, what they were voting to spend on it. Um, they didn't go out to bid, and they had, um, you can see on the right, the, con the uh, estimates range from 17,000 up to, uh, oh, what's the highest one, 27,000 there. Um, well, there's one that's 35,000. Um, so they agreed to give the bid WS Teach out, out of Essex. Um, and it, the cost was going to be 25,000, but his bid was 17. So I don't know what, where the other 8,000 came from that maybe it was add on work or something there. I think WS Teach Out, there's Teach Out Brothers in Essex that is a plumbing and heating business. Yeah. And I think it's a, uh, that's the same family that was doing this work. Um, and he started in the spring and, uh, they were supposed to complete it by November. And here's uh, Vienna Nash plans that he did in two weeks of <laughs> um, the sewer system that uh, this is the cover page that uh, of the sheet and then he had the individual lines um, profiles of them and things and it had two, maybe three discharge points. Um, one you can see uh, on the uh, oh, lower part of the picture there, which is going down along the cemetery bank where Roger and I walk every day. Um, it extended out to the river right there just before the Winooski Street Bridge. And the other discharge point was down by Thatcher Brook. Um, and then the plans show one on the uh, right-hand side there that was more down um, on the southern end of town there. I don't know if it was ever there or not. Would he thought maybe they ran into a pipe uh, when they did Main Street there. So, so that's with no treatment? No treatment. Yeah. Yeah. It's part of the river. They thought the treatment was putting it in the brook, right. the river. Right. Here's um, a uh, table of the quantities and stuff, and uh, 
what uh, you're going to see in the next slide. It was built by Italians, kind of by hand. And there was a newspaper article about Italians being in a trench that was 12 feet deep when it started to cave in. And I'm, wow, you know, you're, you built it by hand and it was 12 feet deep. How long does that take? And I went back and looked at the quantities and uh, trench um, over eight, nine feet deep. There was two miles of trench that they dug that were over uh, nine feet deep. About, um, you know, five miles of trench that was under nine feet. And they must have dug them by hand. And uh, Woody and I were talking, they must have hauled the dirt out by bucket, because I don't think you can throw it out over your head 12 feet. And wherever you threw it, it would be falling back into the um, trench and things. And the water system was also built by Italians, as well as the um, Malmantia's Electric Railroad. So, I know the uh, laborers for the electric railroad came from Boston. I, don't, I assume these maybe did as well. Um, and a little history point, I, I would be interested to know if any of these Italian workers actually stayed in Waterbury and have descendants here today, but I, I don't know that. So. And um, these are John, uh, Collins's notebooks that he had when he built the water system. He was the same engineer on the water. I think so, yeah. Um, the one on the left is the water book, and the one on the right is the sewer book by uh, the engineer Collins. Um, I don't know how they survived the flood of 27. They must have been stored somewhere or in somebody's house. Um, to have made it through the 27th flood without being destroyed. And uh, Woody, you have both of these. Right. Yeah. And he used the uh, sewer one this um, past couple of years when they were actually digging up the sewer that they built in 1907. So the record of who's connected, uh, you can see in these record books. Um, the page on the right there is the page for Elm Street. You can't, it was pretty faint, you can't quite see it. But you can go down through and see the uh, stations along the distance and whose house they connected. And if there wasn't a house there, they said that they were open. Um, you know, James Hattie is, he built where the Prohibition pig is, and there was a laundry. You can see toward the middle of the page was uh, where we uh, put in the Elm Street parking lot and things. So, um, and on the left there is the water book. That's just the uh, names of the streets where you find uh, where they put the water lines in and the ties to the valves and things. So pretty amazing that these have survived. This is, uh, you know, where they told about the uh, Italian workers that uh, constructed both the water and sewer system. Um, on the left there, it tells about uh, they were on Lower Main Street and had dug a uh, ditch to 12 feet and it caved in. Seven of them left the job after hmm. that, so. Um, and on the right there, it talks about 25 workers employed, and they're going to increase the uh, number of laborers there and stuff. And uh, I know the water system has experienced uh, interactions with VOSHA over the trench and trench, and we've been fined a couple times for not having the trench box in there. So uh, we uh, have had experience with that. Um, now you're up to 1966-67 uh, when the, uh, you know, the uh, primary treatment plant was supposed to be built. Here's uh, 
Salty Spalding Owings was the manager from Booth Bay Harbor at the time. He was our first manager um, when they were talking about the uh, design of the system and we um, bonded and got a, a grant for it um, in 60, 1967 there. Um, I couldn't find much information about it other than uh, this, that it cost $639,000 at the time to uh, put the uh, primary treatment, which is primary settling and chlorination and discharge. Um, they had a little drying bag down back of where the pump station is and a clarifier um, that was there. And this is that, where that primary treatment plant is, that's the pump station now. There's the plaque that was put on it, 68, 69, and the trustees were Pete Martin, uh, Jim Littlefield, who lives where I do, and uh, Jack Shea. Um, he was a police chief. I didn't know that he was also a trustee at the time, but he was. And uh, you can see the pump station in the center there. And then the snow on the right is where the clarifier was. Um, I remember in my early days, somebody, I don't know if it was Bubby, talking about the clarifier getting filled with concrete. And Woody remembers, oh yes, we let Anderson supply empty their concrete trucks, their waste um, concrete into the clarifier to kind of fill it up. Um, I wondered whether they had removed it, but obviously not, but it's uh, still there under the snow. And then there's a uh, chlorine contact tank out back. You can see the railings and stuff where it uh, eventually discharged. Um, and the, uh, is this uh, where the switch treatment is right now, or is this the station? Right, right there. Right down here on the other side of, the, of Thatcher right Brook. On the other side of Thatcher Brook. Yeah, right, so okay. Right yeah. There's our building right in the background. Oh, yeah. I see. Yeah. Yeah, you can see the, in that. That's the municipal office, yeah. Just yeah. the other side of that telephone pole? Yeah, yeah, I see it. And the square thing in the center frame is our trench box skip that we oh. talked about. Oh, oh. that's oh. where it is. <laughs> <laughs> Okay now. <laughs> I think yeah, we got one. Better one for 12 feet. Yeah, that one's only good for eight. Yeah. <laughs> and your uh, backup generator sits on the well above the flood mark. Yep. Platform there. Um, so it would be uh, if the plant was upset, you could smell it from here. Yeah. <laughs> if it was still in operation there, so. So that, that acts as the main pump station. Now all the sewage, all the sewer lines come to this point where the old treatment plant was. And then that, you can go down, what is it, three stories? 30 feet. So you can go down Matt. 30 feet deep there, and there's pumps there that pump the sewage down to uh, I think there's one sewer line that comes in here that doesn't cross the brook. Right, there's one that comes down from the roundabout and it'll come in by the driveway underneath the um, train trestle. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then it goes into one central manhole before it comes into the actual main pump station building. Okay. All the rest comes in under Thatcher Brook, clear across the rec field. That's yeah, most of it comes right across. You know, yeah. the soccer field and all that. It goes right there. Goes underneath uh, Thatcher Brook? Yeah. Yep. So this is um, the map on the left shows the sewer line going down, you know, out between uh, my house and next door as it comes down Elm Street, goes down around and then. Uh, crosses over toward the Winooski Street Bridge and then all the way up the wreck field and goes under Thatcher Brook into that pump station. Huh, right underneath home plate. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I did. 
<laughs> um, the old outfall, when you come down around here uh, where it takes the corner to go over to uh, Winooski Street, it went straight out to the river there. Mm -hmm. um, and thing. So, um, and then we had to uh, increase, I don't know why they did it, but increase in uh, payment on the bonds from four to four and a half percent. And uh, said the cost of that uh, plant was $524,000. And uh, that was in 69, we built that. Then in 1977, the state came along and said, well, that's not good enough. Now you gotta build secondary treatment. And uh, I didn't know it, but Charlie Grenier is working for Dubois and King at the time. He uh, helped design this plant. And uh, when we were started designing it, Alex was the town manager during those times. Um, and you can see Newton Baker, I don't know if he was president or a trustee, but he gave them a hard time. Um, you know, we just built this in... Uh, Ten years before? You know, nine years ago, and they told us it was going to serve our needs for some time, and Baker said, we're looking for people we can put our faith in. So <laughs> he was criticizing them for uh, things. They sort of... Uh, said the excuse was we were getting more than 250,000 gallons a day of infiltration stormwater into the primary plant, and that's why it didn't work very well. So, um, you know, this cost $1.8 million. We had to buy 40 acres of land down there and, uh, you know, do all the um, conversion. and the So it handled stormwater as well as sewage? Um, no, it did then. I mean, yeah. Huh. It was going in there, whether it was designed to go in there or not. A, <laughs> a lot of them were designed to go in there, all around the hospital and stuff, those old sewers. Um, you saw the original design when uh, um, Nash did that system. He said it could handle a quarter inch of an hour of rainfall. So obviously, you know, they were looking for those sewers to. Mm -hmm. Take away the storm water. Maybe it's in subsequent of these slides, but um, as I understood it, one of the other things that had to happen here when this one was done was they had wasn't the the state had its own sewer treatment plant over there, right? Yeah, yeah. And it got rolled into this one. Yeah, uh, yeah. That uh, the state had a primary plant out back. Um, of the state hospital there, kind of uh, by the between the powerhouse and uh, you know where the walk path is there now, and uh, they didn't want to operate that, and they didn't want to upgrade it, so they talked and joined in with the village at the time. Um, they still operated a pump station after that for a long time. Yeah, there was a pump station. The old, just like ours. Our primary plant turned into a pump station. All the sewers at the state complex went back to that primary plant there, and they can yep. go back to a pump station that was working right until Irene. And that's where we used to get a lot more flow from the state because yeah. of that inf infiltration and inflow from the river. I tried to find the date that they built that, but I, I ran out of time to find it. I think it was in the 60s yeah. that they built their their plan. Yeah, I, I think it was very similar to the time when we built ours. You know, it was kind of who we built. But anyway, I think the bonds um, for this one are up in the historical society now. I found a bunch of village of Waterbury bonds to pay oh, for right? the sewer system. And, I gave a couple of them to John Sherman, and then the, the rest have to be upstairs somewhere. So. You look at the price differential and what the costs were back then compared to, it's like, it's like everything, but it still amazes you. I like the last paragraph where Charlie Grenier said the plant recommended design to be operated with low electrical costs. 
how much of the electrical costs that went for the plant. They're huge. Yeah. Yeah, and they're still huge, and we've been putting in BFDs and all kinds of energy saving things for, for ages and ages. Just running the pumps? Uh, the air aerators. So $42 a year per user, and now our, our uh, base charge is about $42 per connection. The sewer, up until the 1990s, was paid for by property taxes, by yeah. the village. It was on the, it was on the it was village's on the property area. tax bill, and it was in the early 90s we moved that off and put it on to so we changed that after you were here yeah <laughs> when we when we upgraded the water system and got a lot of the new meters in and stuff like that we converted the sewage over to uh, metering as opposed to taxes because you had you know people with high value properties with no flow that were paying a lot more than some low value property that was a restaurant or something like that. It just was all backwards. There's the uh, little quote from uh, Trustee Newton Baker reminding Grenier that the state officials, that your assurances were given when the primary plant was built in 1968 that it would serve Waterbury needs for some time. So, and that's where it says that plagued with deficiencies and forced to handle more than its capacity because of substantial water infiltration into the sewer system. So. Skip, what were the initial pipes made of when they put them in? What were the initial pipes made of when they put them in in the early 1900s? They're all clay, clay, clay tile pipes. What were the pipes made of? Yeah, they're clay, clay, clay tile. Vitrified yeah. slow yeah. and Yep. There was no cock in around them or anything. Mm -hmm. It's pretty standard back in that day. A lot of them cracked and broken and they got them up. Yeah. It's hard, hard to tell when they had them with a giant excavator. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, they weren't, everything was working. I was going to say, if the stuff that we put in last couple of years lasts as long as those clay yeah. ones, we'll, we'll be happy. Lucky. Of course, hopefully the uh, tree roots won't be able to grow into the new ones as no, easily no. as they could go into the clay. That's true. So June of 28th, 1977, we had a bond vote for this $1.8 million uh, secondary lagoon system. I didn't have time to, I was going to go look in the records and see how many people voted, and probably about 40 people, uh, but maybe more and things that, uh, uh, so. Almost $9 million in today's money, so we'd probably draw a pretty good crowd if there was a $9 million vote. And these are uh, down at the wastewater plant, something Pete put together for uh, tourists, or tours and things about uh, the plant. 77, 5.1 million gallons a day, and uh, he had 150,000 gallons a day average flow since Irene. We're going to see later on now it's up to about 290, and it was what, 350 or 400 before that? Yeah, I'm not sure Pete, what Pete's numbers were, but yeah. Um. Before Irene, it was. It was high twos anyway. Yeah. Yeah. What did you have for flows this weekend? Must have been. Uh, this weekend was about 145,000 each day. Right now. So Which, it's, it's way off. It hasn't come back up. Which 2014 was that one, the tertiary treatment? Yeah. Right That's my And yeah. the state um, mandate. A little bit of a story behind that. The state first wanted us to just throw chemicals out in the pond and let the phosphorus uh, 
settle to the bottom and then we'd have all this sludge to uh, get rid of that's expensive and we said no we don't think you ought to kind of pass the save on your capital costs and pay you know make us pay the O&M costs so we went to the legislature and uh, convinced them that the state you know should include O&M costs in determining you know what's the most cost efficient way to do these uh, improvements and uh, that they would fund the most cost efficient way including capital and O&M and I think they put that into the statue or something yeah, didn't they? Yeah. Well, in there. Yeah. so that was one of the battles that Bill fought for us along the way in his 34 years there and things um, things um, We'll talk more about some of these things as we go along there. Um, this is the current sewer map um, that uh, Matt and Tony have down at the plant now that shows the manholes and it goes all the way up the <coughs> meadow crest up toward Blush Hill there and uh, the pump station down at the uh, ice center on the other end of the system there. Hmm. How far up is the um, that line that goes up past Marrow Press? Where is that ending? Um, Blush Hill. Right. Well, we're in Blush Hill. Well, yeah, Blush yeah. Hill here. Uh, Blush Hill's down a little yeah. there. Right. At the bottom. Right. Yeah. So it goes up to Marrow Press. Marrow Press is the end in Acorn Drive, Oakland Estates, uh -huh. which is as high as it goes. It goes up East Street and then okay. goes up. Um, we have a pump station up on Lincoln Street Extension. So right near the parking ride yeah. is the last area there. But, uh, you know, Shaw's and the car wash and a little shopping uh, where the car yeah. house drive is. And, uh, the and then ben, ben and Jerry's and so on. And then the former church in Colbyville, the yellow building that's the cabin shop now, that right. excavation that's going on there now is getting them onto the sewer system. Is that why there's a concern in that area where I know there's talk of if, if they ever use that as kind of a bypass road, that sewer line being there? Is it? Uh, no, the sewer doesn't go up. You're talking about? You know, the one that goes to the golf course, you know? Yeah, the community path. Right, the community path. I couldn't think There's of no name. sewer line up there. It right. stops, it stops just right. above it's the uh, pump station. Right, okay. All the people coming to and from still wish that bypass was there. Huh. Right. Yep. And this is uh, where the leaving the pump station, the force main, I think it's eight inch that goes along Route 2 um, down to the treatment plant there. Um, Woody said it, it doesn't make that jog when it leaves the plant. They bored under the railroad track when they did the roundabout, so it's more of a direct route there. Hmm. Um, but it comes out of the pump station. And it's about eight tenths of a mile. You can see the Harvey uh, racetrack there across the river. So. And this is down at the plant. The first lagoon is the biggest one. The second lagoon and the third lagoon. And uh, they usually have a retention of 30 days total for the design flows and uh, aeration. And the sludge settles to the bottom. And um, you can see the uh, solar panels over the drying beds we and Chris Parsons installed a few years ago with a contract there and um, I believe this is approximately where the outfall goes or Matt, I don't know where that would be that would be approximately yeah so it's uh, treated effluent after it goes through the coal mag and chlorinated is discharge to the Minuski River there. Um, 
This is looking 30 feet down into the pump station, um, just across the brook here. Um, and it comes in and goes through a bar rack and rags and things. You have to winch it up in uh, pails there every couple days and dispose of it in uh, the dumpster and things. So, You'd be um, amazed at what people flush down. <laughs> no, I wouldn't be. Do we have them. any? No, I would not. Be <laughs> any items that you'd like to present? <laughs> but it, it does have a uh, significant feature. See that spiral staircase to go mm. 30 feet down? <laughs> Matt offered to go down it with me, and I, I went about 10 feet and said, oh, I don't need to go way down there. <laughs> not quite handicap accessible. <laughs> But that is an impressive sterile spiral staircase there. And uh, there's two 40-horse uh, pumps that uh, pump the uh, raw effluent after it comes into the other side of the pump station where you saw the buckets and things. It goes into the force main to pump it all down to... Uh, two stairways, Matt? Yeah, one on each side. Yeah, on each side. There's two spiral staircases, one on the dry side where you can get down to what's on the left and then one on the wet side so you can get down to see the real workings of the fire rack. And so did this all flood uh, during uh, Tropical Storm Iron? Yeah. Um, uh, there was water on the, well, well above the first floor probably, you know. Yeah. And how did that all get pumped out? It, uh, I just, no, we just oh. waited, the water receded, it went down, and then imagine they had to pump out the dry side, right? Yeah, I believe so. <laughs> With the you know, flood proof doors, did, is this likely to get flooded again, or hopefully it stays? Certainly, the flood proof doors are a big help. They would, I wouldn't stay in there, but. <laughs> it'll not like a submarine, but it'll hold the back a lot of water. Yeah. But how much is going to come through the piping is the yeah, yeah. Other question. You know, it'll fill up from the wet side, which is usually what happens when we have problems there. If the pump goes down, the the wet well fills up and it, it goes up, you know, 20, 30, and then it spills over on the other side. So yeah, we 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 Locked off some of those cross connections. Some of those uh, crosses that have been fixed now. Yeah. So, Skip, just before you go on, those are the two new submersible pumps, right? The blue pumps yes. are the ones yeah. we replace that yes. can be flooded now and still function. Okay. Yes. That was a post tropical storm rain project. In Asian? Yeah, we put in new submersible pumps, and then there's also. Uh, there's also basically a, a place where you can bypass and pump out it, right? Um, you can put a portable pump in there you know, to pump out into the system. This is the lab down at the uh, wastewater treatment plant. This is another one of uh, Pete's notes that he put together on, uh, you know, the phosphorus upgrade. Uh, TMDLs, as the department called it, that we went under a 1272 order for about 20 years waiting for them to decide what the phosphorus limit was going to be. And, um, you'll see later on that we do have a real NPDES permit now. But I think if you read that closely, like the second sentence there, prior to the upgrade for phosphorus, we were discharging about a ton of phosphorus into the Winooski River every year, and now we discharge 200 pounds a year. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge uh, reduction. And uh, this coal mag, and, I don't know, the process that we use for removal of phosphorus, they use magnetite. He didn't put the magnetite in here, but the chemicals that we use to flocculate the uh, phosphorus and the pumps there. <coughs> this is the uh, SCADA diagram of the Comag process. 
at the plant that went in in 2014 and did it. I just remember the number of six million dollars. Is that about what? Yeah, I think the I think it was a little more than seven when it all was yep. said and done. We I can't remember what our share was. Uh, we bonded for. I think it was 285 or 325, something like that. But we ended up not having the issue of all that debt. So it was probably seven. Everything was probably a more than seven. You know, and uh, at the water plant, we had the SCADA system. That's kind of some number. I mean, what do you call it when you have the the initials make up the word there, so yeah. Uh, we went about ten years, and then we had to spend a hundred thousand dollars to upgrade the skate system. So we're probably do to upgrade this if it's fourteen and it's coming up on ten years. All the computer parts and everything change, and you can't get them. This is uh, the budget for the sewer plant. Uh, the expenses on the uh, left there, $1.1 million, and revenues on the uh, right there, 933000 So this is where we think Bill does his magic in his financial, how he, you know, spends $1.1 million and he only takes in $900,000. So it's Tom's job in the future. You leave it. That's at the top, and that's how you want to do it. Welcome to Waterford. Fortunately, the 1.1 includes uh, significant uh, capital expenditures that didn't really happen, and there's some borrowing on the right side that didn't happen either. But for, all, for those of you who are, are on the sewer system, you'll probably see a, uh, another rate increase. But uh, yeah, it's it's. Sure. But the sewer system has been the, the water side makes more money because it has another 200 customers and things, whereas the sewer is 200 short because we don't do, uh, you know, up on the loose system and we don't do Duxbury Moortown and the rates haven't been as high in the sewer system. So we've gradually been grappling to raise the revenues to meet expenses and things. So you can see we're still a little short. But, um, How many customers do you have? 800. So about 1,000 water customers. The, the water right. system has about 1,000. Right. 200, I mean 100 with Duxbury Mortown and 100 when we picked up the old system. So these are some uh, of the guests at the uh, water treatment plant. You can see they like the hospitality down there, enjoying the uh, summer swim. Uh, they make a mess of the place. Pete <laughs> wish they'd find another spot. Yeah, they're, they're probably contributing to uh, <laughs> waste. He says he successfully discouraged them from further uh, residing here. He goes out every day and scares them off. And, uh, <laughs> there's also an eagle that used to come, Pete would tell me about, and sit in the trees. There's a um, bull pout they put in that pond, what, 20 years ago? Yeah. yeah. That are still there, and the uh, eagle catches them every now and then. And uh, um, there's turkeys in the field down below and everything. So he, he really... Uh, you know, liked it as a nature reserve there, I think, so. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> this was the other day when I went down to get some pictures. That's the lone resident duck you can see out there. Uh, I think Tony said it was a pintail duck still. He hadn't left for pintail? south in the winter, so. Wow. <laughs> and this is uh, a sludge drying bed. Um, with the sludge comes off the uh, clarifiers and things that spread out here for the to dewater, drain into the sand, and uh, really the freezing and thawing breaks up the water bond and really dries it out. And then 
you can see it's scraped up and we send it to Canada. Um, at the back of the drying bed where the sun gets in a little, you can't quite see it here, but those are tomato and pepper plants that grow from- Volunteers? The, in the sludge, yeah. Huh. Um, Tony was, he saved some seeds and he's got a plant <laughs> He said he wasn't gonna eat the tomatoes, but <laughs> I, I don't know if I'd wanna eat that crime. <laughs> So that's very common in uh, sludge, the tomato seeds and stuff. Hmm. And this is the sludge after they've scraped it up um, and they store it in this bin until you get a tractor trailer full. Um, and then it's uh, loaded into a tractor trailer and shipped to Canada for disposal. Um, Why Canada? Uh, where is it going? Asbestos. Up with their neighbors. You know. <laughs> asbestos, asbestos, Quebec. <laughs> 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 Only the old asbestos mines would fall. For the sludge? Yeah. And it costs what? Ten to twelve thousand dollars a load. I think the total cost last summer was in the ten, twelve, fifteen thousand for sludge. I think. Yeah. I don't know what they have to do to get through customs. You know, trucking. <laughs> We just showed you the pictures of the three lagoons and the organic. Uh, this is this is mostly the phosphorus sludge that gets put up onto these lagoons. There is some addition of organic sludge now because we bought a sludge barge a few years ago. But um, we've in the past, uh, I think three times in my 30 years here, we've had to remove, you know, dewater the lagoons and uh, take the sludge out and we would spread that sludge on the fields around, uh, around, we've got, what is it, 30, 25 acres, something like that, that we could spread the sludge on. And when we would, the last time we did the first lagoon, which is well over a million gallons of capacity, um, it was, over $200,000 to do that sludge removal. So now we bought this barge that they can pull back and forth in the lagoons and send it by a pump down to this drying station. So even though 10 or 15 or 20,000 dollars sounds like a lot to get rid of the sludge compared Gee. to the ordeal that we had to go through to spend $200,000. And that's 10 years ago money too. Yeah. Um, you know, it caused, you got to dewater it, you got to lime stabilize it, get, you know, you got to cook the sludge, get the pH way up to kill the pathogens, and then put it on the fields, and then you have to monitor the fields. There's uh, groundwater monitoring wells, soil monitoring. It's a big process, so we're hoping this will save lots of money in the going forward in the sludge. Costs. That's actually yes. a sludge sled on a trailer right there. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah, yeah. Is there any agricultural application? So, um, no, there's nothing happening now. The organic sludge, you're, we're still allowed to put it on fields. And, you know, uh, Scribner, on the farm down here, he used to grow corn on our fields. Um, uh, when the old man died, that was kind of the end of it. We, we, grew, we grew some hay and rye crops there that we would just turn in. Um, but when the commissioner and the secretary were just here, I guess it was Commissioner Moore, right? She's commissioner now. Yeah. You know, there's places in the country that are phosphorus deficient. So, you know, I told her, I said, you know, we, it would be great if the state could find a market for this phosphorus because you know we're just we're taking that out of the system and then we're paying to send it to some place where they bury a hole in the ground. Wouldn't it be better if we could send it to yeah. Ohio or wherever they might need phosphorus? But so far it hasn't happened. And then we get to our NPDES permit. Is this our first full permit? Yeah. Since, since 1272 had, orders, said, almost since Bill was, came here probably, um, that was issued on uh, March 21st and expires June 25th and is, um, 
I don't say it here, but in another slide, it's 27 pages long. Hmm. And uh, these are some of the testing requirements um, that we have to go through. Uh, these are for the conventional pollutants. You know, there's one for flow and the BOD, which is the biological oxygen demand that takes the oxygen out of the water so the fish can't survive and stuff. The E. coli and the pH and suspended solids and things that are typical in sewage that we need to measure. Then here's the nutrient testing, um, the nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, you know, the phosphorus is what the comag addresses. We don't really treat for nitrogen. We don't know. They just yeah, want us yeah. to monitor it to uh, know what it's there. The treatment plants on the east side of the state that send uh, their effort to the Connecticut River watershed, they've got to treat for nitrogen there because the Long Island Sound has nitrogen issues. Huh. So all of uh, all, both sides of New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, that whole watershed, and then the Housatonic and all those places in New York that go down uh, to Long Island Sound have to deal with nitrogen, whereas Lake Champlain phosphorus is the issue. And then uh, this year, or last couple of years, we had to do this wet testing with whole effluent toxicity, which is, uh, measures the biota and things out in the stream, both upstream and downstream of our discharge point. So that's an added uh, test that we've had to do, and that was like $2,500, $3,000 or something. You know, Pete was concerned about how much it was going to cost and be in his budget thing, so. And uh, we have two facilities that discharge into our system that have pre-treatment permits with the um, environmental conservation as well. One is Ben and Jerry's ice cream plant, which, you know, they, uh, the one that started the UDAG money, but they also discharge the ice cream and really overloaded the plant down here to the point that we had to upgrade and then they had to put their plant in. So they still discharge into our system, but they have a, their own treatment plant and things. And then the El Crest uh, Brewery up in uh, cross, on the crossroad there, that they uh, <coughs> threw beer and discharge into our system too. So Woody just told me that they make as much beer up here in Waterbury as the fancy plant in Stone. Mm -hmm. And how much of a load does that create? The addition of uh, the alchemist uh, waste water? Well, I mean, they, they need the pre-treatment permit because they pre present a problem with at least a, greater than 5% of our hydraulic capacity or 5% of our BOD capacity. So, uh -huh. um, you know, any brewery BOD coming out of the brewery is, yeah. Pretty high. It's really high. Yeah. yeah. Three yeah. or four breweries in town that. At least three that we know. Big and. Well, there's a fourth one in the works, right? Yeah. Skip, they, they don't. They, the, the smaller breweries, you know, the Freak Folk and the one on. Uh, is the one open on Fountain uh, Street? Not yet. Not yet. And then. Uh, the uh, Propagus brewing. Yeah, they all brew. They don't have pre-treatment permits right now, but we do monitor them and they have to, what's called, side stream their waste. They've got to take things out, put them in barrels and sell them to farmers or what have you. Uh, they can't just flush it. But they don't produce enough um, product right now For pre to, to have to make them pre-treat. But that would be the next step if they if they increase the volume dramatically. Skip, what does it cost these days to train a water treatment operator? <laughs> <laughs> I know that's probably the fifty thousand dollar question. <laughs> well, I think you're, Woody you're, and Bill could probably half, you're halfway there, Mike. <laughs> uh, I, I I wouldn't be surprised. So Matt, I mean. Matt's been with us since the spring of 21. 
right since March of 2021. So Matt, Matt had no experience uh, in our uh, in wastewater treatment. So we hired him in 2021. And um, when did you get your? You took your test last spring. Uh, yes, this past spring. So after about a year, so um, we can send them to school relatively inexpensively. Um, and then how long is the class? It's a 48-hour class. And that helps you, that preps you to take the state test. It, it doesn't guarantee like passing, but it definitely helps you with the material that's on the state test. Right. Which is another 100 question, multiple choice. <clears throat> And, and then, um, are you, once you pass that test, I know on the water side you need experience. Do you, do you, to get fully certified, you have to have a certain amount of experience as well? Three years, I believe, for grade two, which is what we need for that facility, it's two years experience. But you can get some of it through like technical, either through college or other work-related um, training. The uh, water and sewer field is like the old uh, police departments of 20 years ago when you'd hire somebody, send them to school, they'd work for a couple of years and go to a bigger department. Right. I think you can train people here, they get their license and they look for other places that, you know, you can get more money. So we, We've been lucky, you know, I mean, uh, you know, Woody was hired in 1990 or so to be the assistant water treatment plant walk, uh, operator. Um, Mike Grace must have retired in the late 90s. No, until was it 2000. That? Was it four, early? Maybe. Okay, yeah. yeah, he had to wait to the Red Sox one. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, and then, and then from 2004 until about 2015 or so, Bill was the water treatment plant operator. We've had Pete Kolchek for uh, over 20 years. Pete's just retiring now. And then, you know, Scott Gallet was hired uh, after Mike retired, and Woody was made the water treatment plant operator. And he's been with us for quite a number of years, about 20 probably. Almost. Yeah. Almost 20. And he just left to go work for uh, Howard Union High School as their facilities manager. So we've, we've had a considerable amount of turnover in the past two or three months. Right. Uh, but uh, you know, before that, we, we, we did pretty well. But yeah, it's a challenging field right now. There's a, there's, yeah. there's a lot of operator jobs that are out there right now. Thanks. If you well, have kids and you want them to stay in the run, tell them to go be a water or wastewater treatment plant operator. Yeah. Nurse. They'll be able to make a living. And then, you know, like I said, we had 800 customers, and the system has five pump stations on it. Um, you know, the ice center, the the states on it, but we don't we don't maintain that one. Our own pump station. There's one up at the park and ride there by uh, foot of Perry Hill, and oh, there's one on Whistle Mountain. So the uh, state. They still have a pump station. Yes. Yeah. They moved it though. It's not right next to the river. It's it's been moved, and it's in a much uh, better location. Even though they have almost no effort now, because yeah. there's nobody working there. It doesn't even look like a pump station either. It just, yeah. Yeah. So here's some of the quick criteria: the permitting and how we're doing at the plant today. Our permit limit is 510,000 gallons a day. And we're currently averaging around 193, so there's room there. And like before Irene, um, we had concern about hitting our uh, pounds of um, BOD per day to treat because the flows were up and the strength of the waste was really up, so that the combination was we were hitting close to our. Uh, limit but now we're not close we've added the comag which is a really super treatment and our flows have gone down so our bod limit is 30 and the effluent on our uh, 
report for October was 7.7. The suspended solids is a limit of 45 and it was 10.5. And the phosphorus limit, um, 0.2, and the COMAG takes it down to 0.06. I, that permit said 0.8, but I know you told me there's a difference between the 0.8 and the 0.2 in terms of how we get there. So. Um, anyway, so we're really doing well. Um, the little uh, label down before, below is on a daily sheet, I think probably Pete put together, which he said permit limits with triple exclamation marks. And uh, he put the limits right down there. And if you go over any of those, you're supposed to call the Department of Environmental Conservation within 24 hours. So, so. We're doing pretty well down there now. And here's uh, what he put together from the flows. Uh, you can see on the left the flows before Irene, they were averaging 303,000, and after Irene, nine years since, they're only 193,000 gallons. So flows have gone down. Some of it is, you know, the state hospital doesn't have anywhere near the employees that it had before. and took down something like, I don't know, 18 buildings or something there. And, um, but high flows have gone down and um, everything there, so. Yeah, you can see that average high flow before I read, mean, that's when the state's pump station was right next to the river. And every time the rain or spring thaw, you know, the water would just pour in there. So, um, a lot, a lot better than it was. So everything is going in the right direction. Um, some of the things our commissioners are working on, and right up at the top, the quality staff that's cross-trained with the water treatment plant, I think that's a really important thing to kind of keep up with, with the loss of staff and being able to maintain. And uh, also the work on weekends is a challenge uh, for us. Um, we want to reassess the charges for the water and wastewater. There's some inequities in the system from the old days and the state changing their design standards and how we administer them and uh, having a category for high strength waste. Um, the facts, oils and grease, the terminology they call fog. Um, grease traps in the restaurants, uh, we still have some that really give us problems in that uh, big pump station 30 feet in the ground there. Um, we were looking at uh, possibly to apply for increase in our permitting capacities before all of this happened at Irene. I don't foresee us doing that now that I think there's adequate capacity for the foreseeable future here. Um, Moortown has expressed an interest in possibly getting sewer service over across the river. We've been, they've inquired of us a couple times. And, you know, so we said we're open to it. I, it would be quite a while before anything would happen. I don't know if Duxbury has as much interest, but, um, and also on the water side, briefly, you know, we are in the process of taking over the Duxbury water system and owning it. So, um, operators, uh, here's Pete, who's almost retired now. They got an award in, uh, you know, 2019, the, the Operator of the Year, and they published a big article about him in the magazine there. And on the right is a picture of Pete uh, giving a uh, reporter the tour. And uh, the reporter through, um, you had uh, given me the reporter's name to write an article about phosphorus. So I talked to her and I set it up with Pete this time. And Woody and I went down and I think we met down there about one o'clock. About 2.30, Woody made up the excuse that he had a meeting to go to and left. <laughs> I stuck around till about 3 o'clock, and when I left, Pete was still talking to her. And he got about halfway through the process. So <laughs> He really liked to uh, 
talked about the system, and he was really uh, took pride in his work and everything he was doing. Uh, you know, he was an exceptional operator, and he's given uh, Matt here his blessing too that he's going to be better than Pete was. So um, here's we have a plaque for Pete too. Um, to rename or dedicate the wastewater treatment plant in his name. And there's our uh, operators of the future, we hope for a long time. Uh, Matt and his uh, assistant operator, Tony, there, who's been here about a year, has he? About a year, six months or so. Yeah. And I, I think he, he gave me the tour here the other day and was really interested in stuff, so I think he's going to be good. And uh, this is the four mass marauders there, it seems like. And the interesting fact about this picture is only one of those people is still an employed in the uh, water and sewer department over the next uh, month or two. So uh, Pete's retired, Scotty took another job, and Brad is going to another job so that was just a couple of years ago so and I don't know if you uh, noticed it in my opening slide with the outhouse that this Pisces award that EPA came up to present to us I warned uh, Cindy beforehand make sure it says EFUD on it it doesn't say but So you folks are the proud owner of this certificate. <laughs> Which means you own the system. <laughs> you know, they don't pay any attention to who's who down there and things. So anyway, they were supposed to send us a new certificate, but I doubt that we'll ever do it. So if you want to see your certificate, it's down on the wall of the wastewater plant. Um, you know, I, we've all gone through the uh, Main Street reconstruction. It seemed like a lot of construction. And I came across this photo as I was working for my you know, photos for this and things. Um, I'm probably the only one here that uh, walked back and forth. This is the replacement of the underpass down here where the uh, street seam is on. It's uh, two girders, 120 feet long, that were brought here on Route 2. You can see it coming up over Bank Hill. It barely made it. Huh. Um, they put piling and rerouted the railroad toward the rec field in order to build the bridge that's here now. So you wouldn't have been able to get into where the wastewater pump station is there now. Um, and then you look at the little the picture, all these uh, kids can sit there and watch construction while it's all going on. So uh, all different times. I remember walking back and forth to school by it and you could see all the activity there and everything. So uh, an interesting, I didn't know back in those days they had trains that looked like that, but uh, I thought you only saw those out west. So anyway. And, uh, that improved the clearance, and that was a really bad underpass. There were a lot of accidents there. And that's a 120-foot span with two girders, which they said is the longest one in New England. So, so that's your bit of history about the scene out there. And uh, this is the effluent. I was. Um, Tony pulled out a jar that was already labeled. I was going to have one and see if you could decide. I also think that jar with the effluent was dirty before we put the uh, effluent <laughs> into it because it does look a little cloudy. So that's the comparison of the effluent um, that's produced out of the plant and the one on the right is the, the water out of the faucet there so you can the see that. The uh, yeah, left. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So. But we control that, we can dirty that one up. <laughs> I, I think you're right. I think the F1 jar is dirty because it's 
I think it's a better match than that most of the time. <laughs> well, when he pulled it there and he was pouring it in, I thought, oh, yeah. <laughs> but I didn't ask him to do it over and stuff. So um, then, thank you for listening. We'll have the pre-operator test next Wednesday <laughs> at seven, so you can. I'll work it up and we'll see who passes. So anyway, thank you and uh, thanks Skip. Very informative. Woody will be glad it's over so I don't email him every day and say, have you got this? Multiple times today. Thanks for coming out. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And if you haven't had a tour of the plant to see the Cobag process. You really should see it. It's quite impressive. Quite impressive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. so if you want to if you want to take a tour, let me know and I can arrange it with Matt. Leave the whole it's definitely oh, worth okay. doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Go down and see if there are ducks still there. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if I pull those there. two plugs there, Mike. Yep. I don't know if I want to be shooting and eating those, those ducks and geese. Thank you, Scott. Okay, we're moving Thanks, on Scott. to manager's items. Uh, the first thing on the agenda is the Sullivan Powers uh, Services and Objectives contract. Bill? Yeah, so a um, month and a half or two ago, you approved the uh, proposal that Sullivan Powers made to audit uh, the 2022 uh, books, uh, the price for the current, for auditing this year, which they will do next spring sometime is $25,000. Um, but because they're auditors, after you approve that, now they have sent us an audit scope of services and objectives. I've got two copies here if anybody really wants to read it, but if I were you, I would accept my recommendation and authorize its approval, and then there's lines for you to sign on the back page. Thanks, Bill. Any further questions on that? Do we need a motion? I'll move to approve the uh, auditor's uh Scope of service, Scope of and, service objectives. and objectives contract. Thanks, Roger. Second. I'll second. We have a motion in the second. Any further discussion on the services and objectives contract? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Next item is consider a grant application for 2023 Vermont Fruit and Nut Tree Program. Steve. Here you go. Thanks. Okay, so I've got a um, couple handouts day. here yep. <clears throat> just to help you get oriented. Okay, so here's the two of you. Yeah, one for each of you. Each of those. And, uh, okay. Well, good. You got the next one here. Oh, next one. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Looks like bingo. Great. And then it does. I wonder if we get a win here. Okay. South Gardens. North Gardens. Thanks. Thank you. Here's the other. So this is a new program. Uh, usually in our tree planting, we're talking about uh, something called Caring for Canopy, which is part of the state urban forestry program that deals more with trees for our streets and um, parks and cemeteries and so on. Uh, this is a new program. It's a collaboration between the uh, Vermont Garden Network and Vermont uh, Urban and Community Forestry Program. And uh, this is a program that um, is designed to increase access to fruit and nut trees through plantings and related educational programs at community gardens across the state. 
So um, I've been talking to Tom and Bill and to Wyatt about this program. Uh, we just heard about it uh, about a week ago at our tree committee meeting. And um, so the application is, um, is due by December 16th. So, so this is really just an introduction and then we'll come back with some more detail. Um, the idea would be to do a pilot. Um, it would be in conjunction with our recreation program. And um, it would be to plant about uh, four to six fruit trees. I think we'd focus on fruit rather than nut trees because they're so slow growing. Though Tom wants us to uh, get into growing chestnuts. So probably in a year or two or maybe a little more, we'll be uh, experimenting with that, which uh, American chestnuts, which I think would be great. So um, the area that we'd like to focus on is, <coughs> is uh, shown on these two maps. It's uh, part of the community gardens that are directly behind our municipal center. Uh, when we developed the community gardens on at the end of Winooski Street, uh, the community gardens uh, back behind our office were reconfigured. Uh, as I think you are aware, we had to take up part of that with uh, the parking lot and the library gardens, do a conversion through uh, the state and through the National Park Service for the parkland, and consolidated some of the gardens in the area that shows on this, uh, this uh, aerial map of uh, Dascom Road Fields. So on this map, there's an area beyond that that um, is actually in, in um, just over the last year or two, it's been used as a pollinator area and um, through an organization that's called um, Be The Change, B-E-E -E yeah. The Change. Mm -hmm. And um, so the uh, fruit trees would be very compatible with uh, their program if they continue and as in terms of uh, providing uh, flowers for pollinators uh, when the trees bloom in the spring. So the idea here would be to work with our recreation program, make an educational program where the kids could help plant, they could keep the trees watered, um, they could uh, ultimately pick fruits and learn to prune trees, this type of thing. So uh, they already do some gardening, according to Wyatt, so it would be an added program or in addition to that program. So uh, the grant is, uh, it's, there's no match requirement. It uh, can be f up to $500 to $1,000. We're probably looking more in the $500 range for four to six fruit trees. We probably get them from Evergreen Gardens, get potted trees uh, that are well, uh, at, are off to a good start and are pretty easy to uh, care for once they're planted. And um, so there's no match requirement and um, it's really a win-win the, the way I see it. We wanted to bring it to you, see um, if it's something you would support. If it is, then we'll come back with some more detail and a more uh, precise budget and that type of thing at your first meeting in December. So that's what I'm, I have. I'm very supportive of the idea. As much as I like Evergreen Gardens, Cost-wise, they're not very competitive. I don't know how competitive they would be in terms of trees and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. you know, I know we like to probably support local businesses, uh, but it all depends. Being a fiscal conservative, I also say, you know, I would like to see it kind of at least some competitive bids go out. Sure. Yeah, we can check prices. Um, and that's usually pretty sure. easy for outfits right. like that. They could they could do that in 15 minutes. Yeah, so. and we could get bare root trees um, right. it, in the park environment. We've planted bare root trees before. They take usually about three years to really get them off to a good start. A lot of, lot of watering. Yeah. So part of the idea would be to get um, get potted fruit trees, <laughs> and I'm sure there's some other good sources we can check around with. Um, with Gardner Supply in Burlington, uh, there's a couple different good sources. Emler's um, have a nursery uh, right over in Moortown, so we can definitely check around and yeah, get check on different sources. That's right. fine. 
I just call them to get prices. No, I, it's an idea it, of what the cost is. It's better. I don't like the idea of you know some of the big box because I have a kind of a background in you know fruit trees and vines and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And the problem is if you go to the big box, a lot of those stock is from out of state in like places here. that are, the the trees might not survive. Yeah. So I think it's a good idea that you do get a local thing that is getting local trees. And, and even some of the local providers don't do that, too. So. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, that's a good point. You don't want to spend a lot of money and just, you know, have, have the trees die off. Right, exactly. So I, I may have missed uh, uh, one of the points, but uh, this is a grant that you're applying for? Or so are you looking for money from us? Right, no, it would be all grant funds with no local match. Okay. Oh, no so local match. it's 100%. Okay. That's my understanding. It's 100% grant funded, and then, you know, obviously we have our uh, staff time involved and that yeah. sort of thing. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, but it would be part of a. Even Sounds like a great program. Yeah. Any qu uh, questions? I would move to approve his. Uh, well, let's bring let's it. bring back some detail too, yeah. if you, if that would be okay. I I don't. Um, yeah, I don't know what you think, Bill. Right. Um, past select boards have been not happy with staff when they come to a meeting and say, "Here's a grant and approve it now." So, Steve talked to us. Uh, last week, and we thought we could get it on. It was a fairly light agenda tonight, so he just wanted to talk about the concepts. And if it sounds like you're in favor of moving forward, so sometime uh, it has to be in uh, December 16th. Right. Deadline, so, so the December 5th meeting, you can okay. we'll we'll come back, come back with yeah. Time. yeah, we'll have information. You're talking about four to. Four to six trees. Four to six trees. It's Total. a pile. So it, Just see how it would it's not occupy. Yeah. And you, we've got a full uh, layout of all these community gardens, but this would barely impact. Uh, yeah, we have a vacant area. We we don't. You can see on here at the North Gardens, which is the site right here. Are they even being used? They are. We have gardens uh, that stretch back. Um, yeah. You know, for the first oh, not even a hundred yards, but mm -hmm. probably you know, a couple hundred feet. But then there's an area beyond that which is not utilized for gardens right. and it just tends to overgrow. So we would probably use that start back in that area. That's where the Be the Change has done some seeding of oh, some uh, different uh, things for, okay. uh, for their program. So we're just looking at just a few trees, not all these spaces being filled. No, no, they, they wouldn't be in the area where the That'd gardens be beyond exist. That. It would okay. be beyond that, yeah. So there wouldn't be a conflict with any of the community gardens. The program likes to have these little orchard areas in conjunction with community gardens. Just, you know, it makes sense, right? right? So that's the idea would be. It would be complementary to and the good cross gardens. pollinators. Yeah. Okay. Bees on all this. Okay. Any other forward to it? I think it's a great idea. Thank you. I do appreciate yeah. that we got it ahead of time. And I think purchasing them locally with grant funds from Evergreen Gardens is a totally fine proposal if we were to be awarded the funding. Yeah, there are there's some other local nurseries too, but we can definitely yeah. check it, check around, sure. Yeah, that's good. Thanks, Steve. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. And I know even more about wastewater now, which is good. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Need any sludge for these trees? <laughs> 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 I thought we would know it has a lot of sludge available. <laughs> oh, yeah, we could do it at a very good price. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we'll look for some good compost things. We're we're now at the end of Thank the agenda. You. Just wanna um I know I think I put it out to a few people that the um, school board chair has asked if we could get the uh, Superintendent possibly on the on an agenda. I don't think it's something that's so real time sensitive. But I know once we really start getting into budget season, that's probably going to be more difficult. So, Thanks. is that something that the board wants to entertain? Um, as a speaker for you know fifteen or twenty minutes. Sure, sir. And I guess. Why not? I'm just wondering if there's any particular. Uh, it, they didn't seem to have a real <laughs> an agenda. Agenda. No. Item. Okay. You know, I think it's 
more getting to know the community. You know, he's new mm -hmm. and uh, I got you know, to probably, shake his hand uh, yesterday. One yeah. of the things you can talk about is whether the school can be closed when there's elections like we had. Oh, there you know, right. That's um, yes. what kind of so, came up. Uh, you know, in in Waterbury, we really don't have another venue that's big enough to handle a couple thousand people. You know, if you can, somebody at the school suggested that, well, you've got the steel room, you can have them vote in here. And Carla and Karen said when they've had, when we've had voting in here once, and they said they can fit three of the stands up. And I don't know how many they had at the school, but uh, it would be very difficult to have that election here. And, you know, a couple of years ago, we wrote to the school principal and the administration and suggested that they have election day off. 2021, the first Tuesday after the first Monday of November, they had an in-service day, except there was no election in 2021. And this year, they had an in-service day on Friday when school was closed, but Tuesday school was open. So I think that, you know, district-wide. I know Duxbury moved there. They're still doing voting by uh, drive, drive up at the town clerk's office, which I find hard to believe. But anyway, we really don't have another place other than the school. And if we, we receive some complaints here from parents that are not happy that there's a whole bunch of adult strangers in the building when their kids are in school. So I know Tom and I talked about it. Uh, a lot of communities have moved out of the school completely, but it would be hard for us to find a venue, I think. How about upstairs at the fire department? How much bigger than here? I don't know. There's no parking at the fire station. Yeah, that is a problem. That is access issues. There's no parking at the fire station. The only place would be like St. Leo's Hall or St. something, Leo's? Then, which is larger. Uh, there's a ramp up there, but again, I mean, it to me, and I don't have kids in school anymore, but there's enough in-service days built into the calendar that I think mm -hmm. that they could choose that day. They usually have in-service days at Harwood, and there's no voting that happens at Harwood. So I know Duxbury used to vote at the Crossett Brook School, and we voted at the you know, Brookside. So anyway, that's one issue that you can talk to the superintendent yeah. about. Okay. That's one that kind of stirred us up. We got, I, I think everyone got, there was a community member who raised that issue. Yeah. And uh, I understand an attorney. Her, her issue, but, you know, I, I do also think that the school is the most appro appropriate place for, for an election, but you just have to, as, as Bill said, you know, move an in-service day to a, you know, a different day, and then you accomplish your goal. Yeah. I should probably give them a little bit of warning that that's uh, of interest to, uh, yeah. before inviting them in. Well, if I get ambushing back. them, so should we invite them to the first meeting in December? <clears throat> We've already got the forum uh, on the ARPA funding. That's public input. Right. Yeah. Um, Second meeting in December. It wouldn't be bad. The second meeting in December is when the, the state, state police, police are coming, coming in, but there's no reason the superintendent should right. see the state police, you know, yeah. if he wants to stick around and listen to their presentation. Yeah, let's do second week. Okay, yeah, great. Who's police first? Are they coming outside? I, I think the police are scheduled to be right at the top. Right. And we can put the superintendent second. Is there anything else that may legally come before us? If, if not, I uh, ask for a meeting, a uh, motion to adjourn. I uh, move that we adjourn. We have a second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Any abstentions? No. Thank you all. Happy Thanksgiving. Have a, have a, have a happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving.